Goedenavond, dames en heren. Namens het bestuur van het Renaissance Instituut heet ik u hartelijk welkom bij de tweede Renaissance lezing. Op deze bijzondere dag, 6 mei 2019. Iedereen in Nederland en zeker iedereen in deze zaal weet nog precies wat hij of zij deed op de vroege avond van 6 mei in het jaar 2002. De politieke moord op Pim Fortuyn, 17 jaar geleden. Mijn naam is Ralf Dekker, ik ben bestuurslid van het Renaissance Instituut, het wetenschappelijk bureau van Forum voor Democratie. Ik mag vanavond de honneurs waarnemen van onze voorzitter, Paul Kliteur, die helaas verhinderd is. De Stichting Renaissance Instituut is twee jaar geleden opgericht als wetenschappelijk bureau van Forum voor Democratie. Van hieruit worden onderzoek, opleiding en voorlichting gestimuleerd met als doel in Nederland een cultuurverandering te bewerkstelligen. Een cultuurverandering in de richting van meer realisme en nuchterheid, meer waardering voor wat er in Nederland is bereikt en meer eerbied voor de enorme inspanningen en opofferingen die dat van vele generaties heeft gevraagd. We hebben grote plannen. De bezetting en het bestuur van het Renaissance Instituut zijn uitgebreid en versterkt. We organiseren dit jaar een winterschool waarin we enige tientallen jonge mensen in een intensieve vierdaagse training de beginselen bijbrengen van het gedachtegoed van Forum voor Democratie. De afgelopen zomer- en winterscholen waren een groot succes, dus we gaan ermee door. En we zijn onder de titel Schoolstrijd gestart met het vergaren van inzicht in de mate en wijze van politieke indoctrinatie in het onderwijs. Met als doel om beleidsvoorstellen te ontwikkelen ter vermindering hiervan. En er wordt hard gewerkt aan een kwantitatieve analyse van de verschillende immigratiebewegingen in Nederland. De resultaten van dat onderzoek hopen we in de nabije toekomst te kunnen presenteren. Maar ook op andere terreinen van maatschappelijk belang willen we ons geluid laten horen. Door middel van publicaties, lezingen en diverse uitingen in social media. Een deel van de publicaties is verkrijgbaar in de stand, in de, de hal hierachter. Dat geldt ook voor de publicaties van Václav Klaus, ex-president van Tsjechië professor en schrijver, onze spreker van vanavond. Als we geluk hebben is hij misschien bereid om een paar boeken te signeren na afloop. Na zijn lezing zal er nog de gelegenheid zijn voor het stellen van vragen. Ik ben bijzonder trots om Václav Klaus als de spreker van vanavond te mogen aankondigen. Zullen we nou even een filmpje kijken? Václav Klaus behoort tot de belangrijkste tegenstemmen in het politiek correcte quasi-debat. Hij geldt als dé criticus van Europees centralisme en voerde een frontale aanval uit op de klimaatreligie. Tijdens de Praagse Lente werkte hij voor een verzetstijdschrift en oh ja, hij was ook professioneel basketballer. Hij streed samen met Václav Havel tegen het communisme en trad met hem toe tot de eerste regering van het bevrijde Tsjechoslowakije. Deze kunstmatige staat, dit België van Centraal-Europa, functioneerde niet vanwege de onoverbrugbare verschillen tussen de twee samengevoegde volkeren. En terwijl Joegoslavië in die jaren uiteenklapte in een bloedige oorlog, wisten Klaus en Havel Tsjechië en Slowakije in korte tijd vreedzaam te ontvlechten. Precies vanuit dat inzicht werd Klaus vervolgens een verklaard tegenstander van de EU, die hij zelfs eens vergeleek met de USSR. Vanuit zijn ervaringen met dat totalitaire regime zag hij ook al vroeg overeenkomsten met de klimaatreligie. Een politieke theologie die meent de geschiedenis aan haar zijde te hebben en alle middelen geoorloofd acht om het utopische einddoel te bereiken. Keer op keer ging Klaus in tegen de vastgeroeste reflexen van de gevestigde orde. En keer op keer wist hij met argumenten te overtuigen. Varslav Klaus, kortom, is een echte FVD'er. Dames en heren, Václav Klaus. So, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for such a friendly welcome and for the, the excellent 
film. I, I, I have to borrow it from you to, to, to use it on other occasions as well. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry I, I didn't understand uh, the introduction done in Dutch, so I, I hope it was not dramatically aggressive to me. At least I hope so, you know. Uh, so once again, many thanks for um, giving me a good reason, a good motivation for visiting your country and your beautiful city, your beautiful Amsterdam. Many thanks for inviting me to deliver the 2019 Renaissance Lecture and many thanks for bringing me here just today when you commemorate the tragic death, the assassination of one of your predecessors, one of the predecessors of your party of Bin Fortune. So I am really glad to get the opportunity also to be in touch with, with your new, relatively new political party, especially after its mm, successful performance in the March elections. I congratulate you for that. I was surprised to find out that my last visit to your country took place already 11 years ago. I almost couldn't believe it. My feeling is that I am permanently, permanently on the road. My average number of lectures and talks abroad is around 25 a year. Does the absence of trips to your country say more about me or about your country? I don't know. You probably didn't want me here because of my very non-conformist and politically incorrect views. Nevertheless, uh, I, I, have to, I have to tell you, I can assure you that you have a good friend in me, a good friend of your country, and the reason for um, such a friendship is very, very special. Some 35 years ago, I was here in the Netherlands marching in Nijmegen, the famous four days march, so four times 50 kilometers. So I know some, my legs especially, know something about, about your country. 200 kilometers was, a, was an interesting achievement. Uh, once again, I don't know why I, I wasn't here for such a long time. The, un the uncritical admirers of the EU probably suppose that it's not necessary to come here. It's sufficient to stop the flight in Brussels. That's not my case. I dislike Brussels so much that I... This is not, I dislike Brussels so much that I don't go there very, very often. In the last years, not at all. I prefer flying over this specific cuckoo's nest, to quote the title of a famous movie made by the Czech filmmaker Miloš Zeman. To be fair, the city itself is not the problem. The institution which has its headquarters there is the reason for me to avoid trips there. My last visit to the Netherlands, of the Netherlands uh, in, 19, in the year 2008, really 11 years ago, was connected with the Dutch edition of my book in which I criticized the doctrine of climate alarmism and the ideology of man-made global warming. The title of the book was, now I will try to pronounce it, it in Dutch, Blauwe Planet in Grüne Kloisters. I, I hope you, you understand me. But the question raised in the subtitle of the book was more explicit. I raised the question, what is endangered, climate, or freedom, 
And my answer was both and is very simple. The climate is okay. The freedom is under a huge attack. This book of mine, this book of mine was presented to the Dutch readers, not here in Amsterdam, but in The Hague, which gave me a chance at the time as the president of the Czech Republic to bring a copy of it the next day, next morning to, to your queen, to the Queen Beatrix. I should admit, I should admit very loudly now that she was not very happy with the content of the book. <laughs> I should also mention that there is another book of mine in your language. It was published in Belgium under the title Folks for Huizing. Is it understandable? The book which has already nine foreign editions is devoted to the issue of mass migration. I will return to this topic later. Uh, my fundamental interest uh, my, these days is the ideology of Europeism, the irrational adoration of the European Union, and the post-democratic reality there. To my great regret, there is directly nothing about written by me about it in Dutch, but, or perhaps there is. Both the doctrine of climate alarmism and the ideology of multiculturalism and its use as a source of legitima legitimization of mass migration belong to the pillars of the thinking of European political, academic, and journalistic elites of the European, I like to call it nomenclatura. I am not sufficiently informed about your political party, about the Forum for Democracy, but what I know tells me that you have very similar views on Europe, on the European Union, on the sovereignty of nation states, on migration, on multiculturalism, etc., if I'm not wrong. I had a chance to meet your chairman, Thierry Baudet, whose views, which he presented during his visit in our institute in Prague two years ago, impressed us very much. So I hope to learn more about your views, your political stances during this visit of mine. Let me, discuss, let me discuss some of the European issues in more detail. I am convinced that they are directly or indirectly con connected with the future of all of us here in Europe and also with the hypothetical but much needed renaissance of our continent. I like the title of this lecture and like I like the title of your, of your institute. So I will make four, four short points. Let me, let me start with the Brexit issue, and it's today's almost desperate fate. Brexit is not about Great Britain. Brexit is about Europe and about all of us. The arrogant dealing of the European Union with Great Britain reveals the, its true face as well as the untenability, unsustainability and unacceptability of the current version of the European integration scheme. We, the citizens of the Czech Republic, have our own relatively recent experience with a specific exit, which was mentioned in the, in the short film here, specific exit this, which led to the termination of the existence of our former country, Czechoslovakia, and with the way how to efficiently handle it. Luckily, we had one great advantage 
we were not members of the European Union at the time. We are absolutely sure. <laughs> we are absolutely sure that the EU would never allow us to divide the country and the EU would make everything to stop uh, that successful, probably the most successful division of a country in modern, modern history. Um, we had one another great advantage. Both our countries, the Czech Republic, the Czech lands and Slovakia, wanted each for different reasons to make a deal to find a good solution, to achieve a friendly split of our original common state that would not endanger our relations in the future. That was our ambition, that was our aim. In the terminology of, some of you may know, in the terminology of the theory of games, we both played a cooperative game uh, in the year 2016, many Europeans and uh, regretfully many Brits as well subconsciously assumed that it would be the cooperative game also in the case of Brexit negotiations. They couldn't have been more wrong. The EU was playing since the very beginning a non-cooperative game. The EU didn't want a positive outcome. The EU wanted to punish the rebellious Great Britain, to humiliate the proud Albion, and to do maximum harm to, to Great Britain. The EU elites also wanted to demonstrate to all EU member states that there is no friendly exit from this very proud, conceited, self-assured, and especially non-democratic organization. <laughs> the EU behavior has not been accidental. It has been connected with the whole concept of the European Union which has undergone a fundamental change during the last three decades. It uh, started not far from here in Maastricht. It's connected with, with your country. I am, to my great regret, the people in Europe have mostly underestimated what happened here in Maastricht um, 27 years ago. The people in Europe didn't take into consideration that the original idea of integration has been slowly, silently, in a creeping style, transformed into a totally different concept. The, or the original idea of a friendly integration of countries based mostly on cooperation on the liberalization of Europe from its overregulation and on the elimination of all kinds of unnecessary barriers between European countries established in the East interwar period. This model has been starting in Maastricht, replaced by an undis friendly integration, was replaced in Maastricht by an unfriendly concept of unification, centralization, and de-democratization. De we should consider it our task to explain this shift to the citizens of our countries. I hope I am with the, this ambition not very far from the Forum for Democracy way of, way of thinking. So that's my first point. My second concerned, which I would like to share with you this evening, reflects the continuing attempts in Europe to downplay the destruct destructive consequences of the mass migration into Europe. This is my second most important topic. 
the European political and cultural elites pretend not to see these consequences and pretend not to understand them. They do want mass migration. This is for them one of the ways how to, de to get closer to their main ambition, which is to weaken the European nation states and to create a new sort, new sort of homo sapiens, a new European man I call very often homo bruxellarum. This is, this is uh, their, this is their ambition to create such a special, special creature. <coughs> to bring life to this artificial creature has become the dream and goal of the politically correct European political elites. They want to get rid of the Czechs, Hungarians, Italians, as well as Dutch people. Uh, to calm down the disappointments and disagreements um, of the common people, the current fashion among the European politicians is to claim that the episode of mass migration is over, that we are already behind the peak, behind the peak of the migration influx. I can't disagree more. The mass migration is here, and to my great regret, is here to stay if nothing, nothing revolutionary happens in Europe. I really believe that your party is one of the political forces which are aware of that and try to do something with this. Let me mention my two specific arguments which um, I consider the most important ones in, in this respect. When discussing this topic, we should always strictly differentiate the phenomenon of mass, of individual and mass migration. This is not done very often. The European political elites, even though they know that Europe is confronted with mass migration, use almost exclusively the arguments relevant for individual migration only. This difference represents the core of my disagreement with them. Uh, there is no doubt that the absorption capacity of countries for individual migration exists and is relatively high. But this is an irrelevant and misleading argument which shouldn't be used these days in Europe. The mass migration is something else than the individual migration. It represents a fundamental attack on the cohesion, cohesion coherence, traditions, habits, institutions, cultural patterns, and social systems of countries which have become the target of mass, of mass migration. It, it, necessary, <laughs> it necessarily leads to substantial cultural, social, and political conflicts, shocks, and tensions. It touches upon fundamental aspects of citizenship, community, and identity of, the, of these countries. Again, the European political leaders pretend not to see this. Maybe they do, but they are in favor of such an attack on the substance of, of Europe. They do it quite deliberately. My second argument is connected with my, with my profession, with my former profession. I'm an economist, and as an economist, I am schooled, I am schooled to apply the terms supply and demand in all possible, possible circumstances. Most commentators speak about mass migration without 
differentiating its supply and demand side, which I consider a methodological mistake. There is no doubt that there, is a, that there are big problems at the supply side. I mean, in, country, in many developing countries of the world, especially in the Middle East, North Africa, and West, West Asia. Uh, this is no doubt true, but this creates a reservoir, a reservoir of potential migrants. Only a reservoir. This doesn't create migration. This is not sufficient to create a reservoir on the supply side. The supply of migrants must eventually find its demand. Without it, no migration can come about. The European countries are strong enough to stop mass migration on condition they decide to do it. Uh, due to it, the demand side is the crucial one, not the wars in Syria, Afghanistan, or Somalia. The migrants find themselves in the European countries and cities because there has been an explicit and implicit demand for them. The demand came, the demand came, and it came from, from Europe. I don't have in mind only the explicit gestures, the well-known explicit gestures like the one made by Angela Merkel in 2000, uh, 2015, even though I don't underestimate their huge impact. Uh, similar gestures and statements have been made repeatedly by many either Euro other European politicians, journalists, public intellectuals, and especially by political NGOs. Such gestures also belong to the official position of the, of the European Union. The less visible implicit demand is the outcome of the contemporary European culture and ideology of multiculturalism, of the very authoritative progressiveness of liberal democracy, of the pseudo-humanism of political correctness, of the European version of its social system, which reminds me more and more my life in the, in the, communist, in the communist era. The European elites understand that to succeed in their ambition to get rid of the nation states and to create a state of Europe and a European nation, they have to dissolve the existing nations by mixing them with migrants from all over the world. This is the main reason why they are supporting and promoting mass migration without paying attention to all kinds of negative and destructive side effects. They don't, they don't want to stop migration. They need it for their irresponsible, destructive plans to change our society. So this is... This is my uh, second topic, uh, m explained more in details in, in my butch book, which exists in your language. The third topic I, I want to raise this evening is the danger of the new era of indoctrination and manipulation of all of us, and especially of our children. Mm indoctrination and, and manipulation based on the irresponsible ideologies of genderism and feminism. This is my third uh, crucial, <laughs> crucial point and uh, <laughs> crucial position. 
I am not an expert on your country, maybe your country, which used to be in some respect in the forefront of it, sees and feels it differently. But in our part of the world, in Central, in Central, in Central Europe, um, we, we see it differently. In, in our part of the world, this destructive attack on the nature of human beings and on the traditional family has become the issue of the day. The pressures from abroad, as well as the activism of foreign-based and foreign finance NGOs contribute to the fact that we, the conservative people, believe, who believe in the traditional uh, views and values, the reason why we are not on the winning side in this respect. The exponents of these ideologies deny the evident and for centuries and millennia undisputable differences between sexes, innovatively called genders, and try to tell us that the sexual identity is a question of choice. Similarly, the family and its basic function to guarantee the reproduction of human race has been pushed back and uh, relations of all kinds of sexual minorities are being put on the same level, if not above it. This has become a fundamental attack on everything normal, on everything which has been the basis for a functioning human society, at least, at least until now. The voluntarily interpreted concept of discrimination turned to be the basis for a fatal attack on the freedom of individuals and on the free society as such. The monstrous campaign, Me Too, is a good example of the atmosphere of fear which starts to dominate the Western world. Let me stress that this time it doesn't come from the East. Um, to summarize, we have to continue defending the past, we have to continue defending the traditions, the inherited values and behavioral patterns proven by history. It's disgusting that the EU holds the opposite view. Again, I suppose I am on the same boat with, with your party here. And my final, final remark will be a short one. Uh, we, in our part of the world, uh, experienced the Cold War. And in the Cold War, we were on a wrong side as compared, as compared to you. These days, we are alarmed. We, these days, we witness the birth of a new Cold War mentality, which is demonstrated by the demonizing of Russia and by using... <laughs> and by using the failed country of Ukraine for, for this demonization. Once again, in our part of the world, uh, we have many, many reasons to remember the imperialist Russian or perhaps Soviet Russian ambitions and policies in the past and their consequences. For my generation, this experience was a fundamental part of my life. I was almost 50 years old 
in the moment of the fall of communism. So I spent most of my life under the Soviet domination of my country. For my generation, this experience was a fundamental part of our life, something the people in Western Europe are not able to imagine. We are, due to it, we are sensitive, perhaps oversensitive in this, in this respect. We can't, however, accept the current attempts to hide the domestic problems in our countries and in the whole of Europe by shifting attention to pseudo problems in international politics. I am convinced we should accept Russia as it is, not demonize it. Uh, we should respect its authentic national interests and with all our criticism of its political and economic system, uh, we should try to find a peaceful coexistence with it. It has no connection with, with communism. Um, by, but by saying that I don't want to suggest that Mr. Juncker should speak in Trier at the Karl Marx statue inauguration last year, or that you should find Karl Marx Platz and Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg metro stations in Berlin 30 years after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. On the contrary, we should resist Marxist ideology in all its, in all its versions and manifestations. <laughs> the old Marxism is dead, and I can assure in Russia not less than in Europe. Uh, the non, no less dangerous neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism, as it is sometimes called, um, the no less dangerous neo-Marxism is, however, much stronger in Western Europe now than it is in Russia. That's a crazy, crazy <laughs> irony of history. Um, the Ill illiberal doctrines come to us in Central Europe these days, not from the East, but to our great regret from the West. This is the difference. Because of our past, we have a sort of comparative, comparative advantage to feel this danger very strongly and to see it very clearly. Please listen to us in this, in this respect. We, we, we lost a lot in the communist era. Uh, people like me, after the Soviet invasion in Czechoslovakia in 1968, in the Prague Spring era, you know, people like me were not alive, allowed to move out of Czechoslovakia for the next 20 years. This is something that the people in the Netherlands can't imagine. You, with all the problems of that era, you could go all the time to spend your holidays in Spain or in Italy or Greece or I don't know where. So listen to us in this, in this respect. My, my last sentence, one last sentence. Um, I was motivated by the title of your, of your lecture, the Renaissance lecture. In the Renaissance of our continent is definitely our aim, it's our goal, but uh, we should know that the renaissance of our continent is a long way ahead. We should do our best to make it shorter. I wish you 
your party and all the Dutch people. I wish you um, much success in your endeavor in this respect. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I must say, I, I hope to get something else than just water. <laughs> but, but, but it's a politically correct drink. I, am so I hope you are prepared to answer some questions yeah. from the public. Mr. Klaus, did you, did you say that the Ukraine was a failed state? And why is that so? You know, I, I am not an expert on Russia. Definitely. We knew something about Soviet Union in the past, and um, we ceased to be interested in that part of the world. So I don't pretend to be an expert on Russia. Nevertheless, some realities are well known. The Ukraine is the least successful or the most unsuccessful part of the post-communist world. Uh, Ukraine didn't make the element, elementary and absolutely inevitable transformation measures, both in its political life and in its economic life as well after the fall of communism. Ukraine is a totally divided country. I, uh, you, for us always there were two comparatively similar countries, Belarusia and Ukraine. And we supposed originally that U Ukraine is in a better position and that Belarusia with Mr. Lukashenko very strange person is really has no chance to, to, to achieve anything. If you look at the developments of, of Ukraine uh, since the fall of communism, there has been zero economic growth. And if you compare the GDP per capita in Belarusia under Mr. Lukashenko and the GDP per capita in Ukraine, it's 50% higher in Belarus. So I am really afraid that Ukraine is a failed state, divided country. Mm, they don't trust one another. The two parts of Ukraine don't cooperate. cooperate. I will never forget um, in the early 1990s the Ukrainian governor of the central bank often visited me and to ask for advice, what to do in the Ukraine. And, and he became, Mr. Yushchenko, then became the president of, of, of Ukraine. And I will never forget uh, our debate once in Prague, but uh, you, you pretend to understand everything, but how is it possible that you are, as a central bank, you are not able to control the money supply? You have the hyperinflation, uh, which, practically kills everything in the country. And he answered me, well, it's difficult to, to control the money supply in the Ukraine because I am not sure where the borders of Ukraine are. <laughs> so there was such a, such a fuzzy, fuzzy state of affairs in the Ukraine that I am afraid that, that this is a failed state to my great regret. I don't, I don't criticize the Ukrainians, but the Ukraine, by the way, is the main source of migration to my country, to the Czech Republic. You know, the, in this respect, we are in a relatively good position because the Ukrainians are the Slavic people, 
the, the, uh, the language is not so different, so they are able to learn very rapidly Czech, so they are assimilated uh, very easily into our country. But to my regret, the, the country doesn't, doesn't function, and it's not because of Russia. I am convinced because it's because of the Ukraine itself. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Klaus, thank you for your excellent speech. Uh, you have experienced repression and you thought us something about comparisons. Uh, you experienced uh, repression in a totalitarian society. Today we live in a kind of semi-totalitarian liberal democracy. Do you have advices or insights? How can we change the situation? Because you were not only a professor, you were also a revolutionary. And how can we change the institutions and the way in, in the society? based on your experience living in a totalitarian society. You are, if I understood it correctly, you are asking about how, how to change the institutions here in Europe. Well, uh, how, how to uh, change from a totalitarian environment uh, into a better environment. Well, you, there are similarities between what we have here now and what you, you used to have. You know, we, I, I was very critical of the European Union immediately after the fall of communism. I was uh, quite famous in the, in the Czech Republic in that I was the first, you know, the slogan in Prague in November 89, in the moment of the Velvet Revolution in Prague, written on all the streets in Prague was back to Europe. And I was very early, the first one, who on TV was saying, well, but the slogan back to Europe, which means to become a normal European country again after 40 years of communism, back to, back to Europe is a different idea than avanti into the European Union. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a... A totally different concept. I must say that I didn't succeed in convincing everyone in the Czech Republic about this subtle, subtle difference. Nevertheless, I was very critical. Then I, I was in a position of prime minister and president, so I, I had to bring the country into the European Union. We didn't have any other chance. We didn't have the luxury of being Switzerland. We were a post-communist country and to, I, I remember when I was critical to the EU in the 1990s, everyone asked me, well, if you criticize the EU, which means do you want to integrate with Mr. Lukashenko in Belarus and Mr. Milosevic in Serbia? That was the position which we, which we faced, and so, so we, we almost had to enter the European Union. But you signed yourself, didn't you? I, 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 I sent the application letter <laughs> to, the, to the EU in, in January 19, 1990, 1996. But um, I was always joking that we are experts on velvet revolutions. So we have to enter the EU and the night we enter to start a velvet revolution there. That was something I was, I was repeating. I was repeating uh, permanently, officially on TV. Um, I, must, I must admit, that we didn't succeed in doing, in doing it, you know. When I remember the Dutch politicians in the 1990s and in the last decade, there was a total lack of understanding of our criticism of the EU and the same was in other, other West, European, West European countries. We, I expected that the euro crisis, the euro debt crisis, the mass migration, and all of that, the Greek crisis, and, and would, would somehow awaken the, the Europeans. I am sorry to say it didn't materialize. I was, as some of you may know, 
I, I was trying to block the continuation of the Maastricht Treaty. I, I tried to block the Lisbon Treaty, which was a very, <laughs> very famous story. And I was the last head of state who signed the Lisbon Treaty, and they were waiting for me for several months, and they were sending one, one emissar after another. Um, and I must say that the Czech people, the Czech Constitutional Court was not on, I have a fight with the Czech Constitutional Court about it, and so on and so on. So I, I signed it, I got something uh, uh, for it, um, uh, something relatively positive for our country. Nevertheless, the fact that the Lisbon Treaty shifted the European Union again dramatically to another institution is, is the tragic fact which I'm afraid of people, the normal people in Europe still don't feel, don't underestimate. So we need, we need probably I never, as a politician, I never asked for a crisis because it seems to me that this is not fair from a politician to hope for a crisis to come. But I am afraid that Europe needs a deep crisis, otherwise the people wouldn't be able to wake up and to, to see all the, all the problems of the European Union. The, the existence of a post-democracy in Europe is something with our background, with our experience, is something very tragic, you know. My country, the Czech Republic, has spent three, three centuries not to be a sovereign country. We belong to the Austro-Hungarian Empire and were ruled by, by the, from Vienna. That is our, it, it, it's in our bones. This is part of our, of our experience. Then we, we, we were for 20 years an, in, an independent country after the First World War. And then came Hitler and occupied us. And so for six years we were ruled from Berlin. Then we had three relatively relatively free years uh, between 45 to 48 then came the communist putsch uh, co-organized from soviet union and we were 40 years um, ruled and masterminded from moscow and we wanted to be a free and sovereign country that was our aim after the fall of communism. We didn't expect to be again, again part of an, another empire, this time called the European Union. And we feel that we are ruled from Brussels and not, not from Prague. So that's our, our feeling. But we have, to, we have to fight. And I'm sure you try to do it. President Trump has announced um, NATO has invested 100 billion euros uh, or dollars into uh, American uh, war uh, gear. Is the crisis not already in the making? Well, I, 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 this is not what I, what I feel. This is not what I, what I see directly. That's, in, in the, that's a total tension with Russia, building up the tension with Russia. That, that's what well, you know. So the question is, I am trying was... to explain the the Americans that they should think twice about all of that. And, no, the only thing I can I can do. On the other hand. 
with my past experience, we, I brought the country into NATO <laughs> uh, more than 20 years, 20 years ago, and, um, and um, we are fighting the, the idea of having the European army independent from NATO, so this is another of our, of our uh, strong views which is shared. Uh, in my country by um, by a majority of people, even by the majority of uh, politicians in the country. So in this respect, this is a positive development. Speaking about the about, uh, United States, you know, with all the eccentricities of Mr. Trump, I must say that people like me in our institute, we opened the bottles of champagne when the news came that, uh, that Trump was, was uh, elected and, um, and he, we think that uh, the fact that Mr. Trump in many of his speeches, but especially the speech in Warsaw two years ago, he is fighting for the nation state is uh, in, and against the international organization as the United Nations. Well, this is for us uh, an important, important help in, the, in this respect. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Klaus, do you believe in NATO instead of the European Army? Well, I am really very much against the European Army. Uh, you know, for, um, for um, many, many checks, uh, the, the true moment of, uh, of um, forgetting the past was really not the entry into the EU. For most of the Czechs, the true moment of change of, uh, of feeling that the, the past is definitely over was the enter in the entry into NATO. This is this is something that I should say, uh, that I should say very, very explicitly. And um, and I I don't want to say. Well, I remember some 30 years ago I discussed it at a conference uh, organized by Helmut Kohl in in in. in in Germany, in Bonn, um, someone suggested the European army. Uh, and I said, well, I would never send my sons to, to serve in the, in the European army, you know. Now I, now I, must, I must say that, that the sons are already grown sufficiently, so I should repeat the same story about, about my grandsons. <laughs> Can you take some more questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Klaus. A great honor. Would you perhaps uh, share some thoughts, uh, your, your thoughts with us uh, about the uh, annexation of the Crimea? You know, first, I don't like the historical, historical mm -hmm. debates about the fact that Crimea belonged to Russia for centuries, then, then the, one of the very special personalities of, of the Soviet Union Politburo, Mr. Khrushchev, in 1954 gave Crimea to Ukraine without any legal legal preparations, without without a referendum, without anything else. So this is not the beginning. Uh, for this is not the main argument for me. I I I don't know what to say easily. I am convinced that the developments in Ukraine and. Uh, probably made it inevitable for Russia to bring Crimea back. You know, when, if some of you 
plays chess. Do you play chess, some of you? There is a, there is a, there is a term in chess called the forced move. I don't know how you say, how you say it in, in, in Dutch, you know. How you say it in Dutch? Nutzen, the forced move. Zetwang, yeah? Zetwang, the forced move. Yeah. Forced move, you know. So we understand the term forced move. I am absolutely sure that for Putin, uh, the, the occupation of Crimea was, was a forced move. It was just a few hours after the very successful Sochi Olympic Games. I am absolutely sure that Putin would be very happy to return to Moscow and not to do anything to enjoy several years of quiet life. So I think he was pushed to the decision and it's not a, it was not a specific Putin's decision. Anyone at the head of, of Russia in history would have to do the, the same thing. So I, I, I wouldn't consider the Crimea issue as, as the main issue which changes my ways of looking at Russia and Crimea. Who was provoking was definitely Crimea and, uh, and was definitely Ukraine. And, um, and Ukraine would never do it without a radical support coming from Brussels. So I am afraid that indirectly EU is responsible for the occupation of Crimea. Dobry I have never pan discussed Klaus. it with Mr. Putin, I must say. This is just my interpretation of events. Dobry večer, uh, pan Klaus. Would it be possible to join the critical EU parties in the Slavic world to create a uh, opposition in the European Parliament? Well, I hope you will. You will. You will have how many? How many candidates you have for the European Parliament? Twenty-one or no? How, how Twenty-nine. I think. Twenty-nine. So I am rather pessimistic, so out of the 29 candidates, I hope you will get 25 in the, in the European Parliament, so in the, in the forthcoming elections. Anything under, under 20, Mr. Chairman, under 20, anything would be a disaster for the party. <laughs> No, I, I am absolutely sure that, um, that it's necessary for, for all those such parties as the Forum for Democracy is to come together. I have been trying after the termination of my presidential, two terms presidential office, I have been trying to put together the leaders of such parties to my great regret, I discovered that it's difficult or almost impossible. I don't criticize those parties because uh, the, the parties in Forum for Democracy, AFD, uh, Nigel, Nigel Farage, Madame Le Pen, Salvini, and so they are the national parties in, in the nation state. They don't have the ambition to create a European party. So they are not so happy on, on being together. And I was very frustrated when I, I, I saw the very many similarities in their views. But Nigel Farage would never, never join a group together with Madame Le Pen. Uh, if they would never join something together with, with, uh, with the Austrian Free Party and so on. I am very sorry that to change this, this way of thinking and this situation would need a real leader of uh, 
accepted by all those parties, which is not the case, to my great regret. I, I follow very closely the AfD in Alternative für Deutschland. In, in Germany, they are not able to, to select a chairman of the party. For that reason, they have three almost chairmen, you know. So they are not able to go together with any other country. I am afraid this is a big problem. I hope your entry into the, into the, into the European Parliament could make a positive, positive step forward. That's my only hope and expectations, and I'm ready to help in this respect. Uh, we hebben tijd voor twee laatste vragen. We don't see you. Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think about uh, Viktor Orban? <laughs> Viktor Orban is a, is a, is a European Democrat uh, accused by all the Brussels people that he is a populist. I don't agree with, with that characteristic. Mr. Orban is a, is a really democratic leader and um, we may have different views on individual issues, but I discussed it many, many times uh, with him discussing Europe. Our views are identical and I am absolutely sure that the views of your party will be identical with Mr. Orban's party as well. Uh, I was um, speaking in Budapest three, four weeks ago uh, when Mr. Orban organized a big international conference about migration. Again, he, he asked me to make the opening speech, you know, the, which means again our views about uh, mass migration are again identical and I think very close to the views of your party. So I wouldn't demonize Mr. <laughs> Mr. Orban. He's, it's very easy to call anyone in Europe a populist. It's the easiest attack on the integrity of anyone. When, where, whenever uh, when someone dares to criticize the current European arrangement, he is immediately accused to be a populist. I disagree with this fundamentally. Populist... <laughs> mm. so, populism is not a doctrine. Populism is not an ideology. Maybe the populism is a technique of uh, speaking, of addressing the people. I, I would, in this respect, I would compare uh, the term populism with another wrongly used term, uh, uh, terrorism. Again, terrorism is not an ideology. This is a way how to achieve some some results. So I, I think both terms, terrorism and populism, are basically wrong and we should resist them as much as possible. Now we've arrived at our final question of this evening. Good evening. Um, could you please tell me what we could learn for the future um, about the successful sl split of Czechoslovakia? What optimistic um, ways of thinking can we learn from your successful split of the countries of Czecho, Czech, Czech and Slovakia? There must be some things that we can learn. You, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, simply I was born in Czechoslovakia and I, I didn't expect in my lifetime to, to, to experience the split of the country. And uh, we discovered that in the moment of the fall of communism, the Czechs, we were absolutely happy with what happened. 
we want to liberalize, democratize, to introduce total political democracy, freedom, parliamentary democracy, free markets, and so on. And we were surprised to, to hear that the Slovaks want to, to change the, the existing federation. That was really a, a surprise for us. We didn't expect it. it. It started with a crazy, crazy experience. In January 1990, it was one and a half months after the after the Velvet Revolution, after the fall of communism, you know, we, we were preparing the radical economic changes, uh, radical, really, changes. And, uh, uh, and, um, and uh, suddenly our parliament started to discuss something we didn't pay attention to. The idea was to change the name of the country to eliminate the adjective socialist, Czechoslovak Federative Socialist Republic. So the idea was, suggestion of some members of the parliament was to, to eliminate the, the adjective socialist in the title of the country. I must say that the government did not pay attention to that discussion, because we consider it as an elementary issue. No, we didn't expect any, 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 uh, uh, any protests against it. To our great surprise, the Slovaks, and we are talking about the second week of January 1990, which means really we were, the government was formed on the 10th of December, which means we were one month in the, in the first non-communist government. And to our great uh, surprise, Slovak suggested to make another change. And the change was the suggestion was to introduce a hyphen between Czechoslovakia. I must say that we were absolutely horrified and uh, didn't expect anything like that. But it was the, the first signal that Slovakia wants uh, not Brexit, but Slovakia, or how to, how to call it. Um, uh, so, so, I, I didn't want it. I, I suppose that we would be able to continue together. But then, when I understood after the elections in 1992, that, that really they want to have their star in the EU flag. That was the dream of the Slovaks. Well, I said, if it is really so, okay. But let's do it friendly quickly, as fast as possible. And we had elections in, in June 1992. And um, in Slovakia, uh, all the political parties which wanted to continue Czechoslovakia lost the elections that they even didn't get into the parliament. So there was no one in the Slovakian political representation who would defend the common state. So when I met for the first time the Slovak prime minister, who was the result of the elections, I understood that there is no way to keep the country together. And I'm shocked about Brexit because we had the, these crucial elections in, in June. In December, the country was divided. You know. We succeeded in signing 25 25 intergovernmental treaties to divide everything from the number of uh, military planes to, to the embassies all over the world. We, we simply decided to make simple rules, so not to measure the, the quality of the building in, in The Hague or in Brussels. Simply we decided when the Czechs get the embassy in, in Washington, then the, Canada, the Slovaks would get the embassy in Ottawa, one for one. So we made simple, simple 
rules how to divide everything and it was done in in five months, six months time. So I always suggested that I'm ready to volunteer to make Brexit uh, simple and easy. But I'm, I'm uh, afraid, I'm afraid the Prime Minister may, wouldn't be happy with that, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Watch of now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. He expected that the boss would say something. <laughs> I don't think I don't know. We expected that uh, Mr. Chairman would say something. To... A few words. A no, few no, words. No, he should correct. He should. He should. He should uh, correct all my wrong positions. He should correct all my mistakes, all my, all my everything, to make a corrective speech. Now it's, it's uh, your turn. <laughs> I enjoyed every word. It was very inspiring. And it was also wonderful to see so many of you tonight here. Lots of faces that I've seen at many of our events before but also a great number of new ones. Uh, I hope you had a very inspiring evening. I think the Renaissance Institute with Rolf in the board and uh, many others who are here now. I've seen Paul sitting over there. The other Paul is uh, not here tonight, but Paul Frentrop is here. Paul Cliter couldn't be here tonight. Rob Roke is also here sitting in the front row. And of course, uh, I think um, the executive director of the Renaissance Institute should should really get an applause from you. It's Peter van Duyvenvoorde, one of the co-founders of Forum for Democracy. Give him a big hand. It's fantastic that the whole zaal gewoon vol zit. We hebben twee weken ontzettend hard gewerkt met elkaar om dit voor elkaar te krijgen. En ik denk dat het een ontzettend bijzondere lezing was. Vooral de laatste zin, hè? Uh, de Renaissance. Dat is nog een lange weg. Laten we het wat korter maken. Ik denk dat dat precies is wat we proberen te doen met het instituut. Met lezingen, met onderzoek, met boeken uitgeven. Die renaissance die moet gedaan worden. Dat gaat een lang weg worden. En wij gaan het met elkaar doen. En wij gaan ervoor zorgen dat het korter wordt. In de hoop met jullie samenwerking. Dank je wel voor vanavond. En nu gaan we met... Uh, President Klaus naar achter om wat met elkaar te drinken en boeken te kopen en te laten signeren van hem. Want hij is hier nog de hele avond om samen met ons na te praten. Tot zo achter.